Okay, Rod, we're good? All right, great. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to the apartment download for Q3 of 2021. Um, we're going to, um, Rod, I, what did I agree? I put the background on? Yes, I put the background on. Okay, good. So what, what you might want to do now is in the top right-hand corner, go to speaker view, okay? And uh, oh, hello, Jackie. Nice to see you, Mike. Welcome. Did I see? Did I see Father? Father, you're here also. Um, yes, nice to see you. Okay. So what I want to do? These, these are the topics that we're that, that we're going to discuss today. Okay. Um, and I'm going to take uh, you know maybe five minutes on 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 each topic and go through what it means to the apartment industry. Uh, you know, in general. So we went through a a five six week election, right? It was, uh, it was, uh, it was. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think a lot of people had a lot of fun during it. I'm a political wonk, but it was uh, tough to sort of. Thank goodness our elections are only five or six weeks, and not you know one or two years the way they are in America. But I think that the result of the election really, from and I'm, I'm talking about the apartment industry here, really showed us how left the world has moved. Okay, because. Our conservative party clearly moved to the center. The liberals and the NDP moved to the left. And I'm not really talking about what your politics are. They are what they are, you know. But but I think we have to realize that we are in a um, we're in a regulated business. Okay, we're in a regulated business, and and the majority are from Ontario. Um, in Ontario, we have a regulated business because to a large extent, uh, rents are controlled. But uh, what I thought was interesting during the election is just how much talk there was about affordable housing. I mean, it was, it, but yet when you read the platforms of the party, and I talked to the political parties, to, to, to the housing critics and so on, there's, there's really still not, I mean, there's a desire to get affordable housing to be built, but there's not a clear path to build it. Uh, we think that there is a clear path to build it, and that path involves uh, less government, not more government, okay? And I think really if the government got out of the way, we could build housing. I'll give you this example. Between 1955 and 1975, there were 400,000 apartments built in Toronto, okay? And they were built by, four, by about 20, 20 companies, 20 people, okay? Most of them were Holocaust survivors. There was actually a movie made about it called Shelter, which I was lucky enough to be in. That's, uh, that, that's just sort of an aside, but you know, and, and, and the zoning document for the city of North York was four pages, okay? Today, it's, it's, it's seven volumes, right? So we put so much, and, and that's how we created all the affordable housing stock. But anyways, enough, enough said about that, that um, we are in a regulated business with the way the world is moving. I would probably say you would expect more regulation rather than less. That's sort of what the election told me. Um, I think that, um, you know, if you look at the direction that the world heads when it comes to, 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 to ideology, it sort of starts in Europe, Northern Europe, sort of comes to Canada, and maybe then it goes to America. That has all now been, you know, short-circuited, and you see a lot more regulation of housing in Europe. There was really no regulation of housing in America, and yet now there were, you know, significant eviction freezes and things like that, and many of those freezes haven't been taken off. So I think the election result was um, nothing changed in terms of, you know, the way the parties were in Canada. But I think that you, you, you are seeing more government interference in housing, you're going to see more government, um, um, uh, you know, participation in affordable housing. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, next year in, in Ontario, as we have a municipal elections in 2022, I think you're going to see some changes there too. Um, if you look at the asset classes that we've had, that we have that have done well, industrial and apartments have done well. They've done extraordinarily well, and you know, retail, office, and uh, and hotel have not done well. Uh, municipalities have spent a ton of money. Uh, everybody spent a ton of money. Where are they going to get that from? I would suspect that there are going to be municipal tax increases coming in the apartment industry um, in the next in the next few years. And that you've already seen that happen in Alberta, um, in Edmonton, 
taxes have gone up about 25% in the last three years. At, at Alberta was in a downturn well before, you know, we're in one or if we're going to go into one. So they're sort of a leading indicator, I think, uh, I think of what happened. So apartments did well. Apartment owners have done pretty well. I think they will be seen as maybe a bit of a, a soft target as, as, a, as a way to raise um, revenue. Okay. So, so that, that kind of covers sort of the, the comments I wanted to make on the election in that I don't think it was necessarily positive for our industry because regulation is typically not good for an industry and, uh, and, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's the way that it is. Um, I want to talk a little bit about affordable housing. I think affordable housing is something that, um, you know, is, is something that I think has, has legs, you know, and, and, you know, you know, there's there's a statement that, that you know they make on Wall Street: the trend is your friend, or go with the flow. Well, if governments want to make affordable housing part of their program, and clearly that was the case in the last election, the NDP, the Liberals, and the Conservatives talked a. I don't think I've ever heard that much talk about um, affordable housing ever before. It was a central theme of the election. Um, I think. You're going to see in the next election, mayor, mayors talking about it because, quite frankly, when there's an affordable housing problem, I think the buck stops on the mayor's desk, not on the prime minister's desk, and um, and and so much of building um, happens at the municipal level, and if you're going to make changes to make affordable housing work, I think the municipality has more tools to create affordable housing than the than than the federal government does. The federal government has taxation and CMHC. The municipality has municipal taxes, which they can waive. And in, it, we've seen them waive it in, I think in Regina for 15 years. In Winnipeg, there are specific areas where you can build apartments, you pay no taxes for 15 years. Toronto's open door program waives municipal taxes. That's a huge, huge number. Municipal taxes typically make up 30% of the um, operating costs. And if you can if you can not pay that for several years or for a, a decade or so, it makes a huge difference to the, um, you know, to the returns that you're going to get, okay? Uh, the calculation in terms of valuation of the broker is a little challenging because there will be taxes in 10 years. You've got a net present value, the savings, and maybe take that off the purchase price. So um, affordable housing, the trend is your friend. Um, if governments want this to happen, and they put enough money towards this, it will work. Um, it would be smart for them to more get out of the way and let developers build it, but I, I, I don't know if that's, if that's going to happen. The other point I'd make to you is that it's still early in the game and that more policy is coming. The policy is not coordinated yet between the federal, the province, and the municipalities and CMHC, but I think that has to come. So. The overall message is um, more affordable housing policy is coming. Uh, don't don't fight city hall. Go with the flow. Wait for it and uh, and start becoming and start becoming the expert at it. We see a, a lot of affordable housing in our company's future. We do feasibility studies. Some of the guys who do feasibilities are are are, are on here with us. Um, and um, uh, prior to the shutdown. We didn't, nobody asked, not a lot of people asked to look at the affordable option when they build a building. Today, almost everybody asks us to look at building the building as either affordable or conventional apartments. So we see a lot of affordable housing in our future. We have a seminar, a live seminar scheduled for October 28th and 29th in Toronto. Well, we got limited capacity because of COVID, but you can also attend online. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if that's where you want to come. Um, I think I would say that not in downtown Toronto, because right now building high rise is just difficult. But if you're a developer and you and you want to consider building affordable housing, the numbers do work, but you've got to look at them differently. And you've got to look at your return, your equity investment, the fees that you get and things like that differently than you would if you were building it to keep. But But, but I believe that the numbers can work when the different programs line up, but it's not one, it's not one simple formula. It's, it's, uh, it's very, it's very specific. Okay. So that's, that's really the comment that I want to make affordable housing that it's coming. And I think that if enough money is thrown at it, 
um, it will, you know, it will work. Okay. So next, let's talk about vacancies. We used to talk a lot about vacancies when, 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 when you know, when the shutdown first started, we did six webinars in March, April, and May of, of 2020. Um, and, uh, you know, we always talked about vacancies, but you know what? We're not talking about vacancies much anymore. Um, I think that it doesn't really seem to be a big problem um, at all. Uh, if there is a challenge, it's still in the downtown core where the offices aren't back. So, uh, so, so newer buildings or high rent buildings or highly renovated units um, will, will still have a problem. It's not as bad as before, but it is, I, I think it's fair to say that it's, it's rectifying itself. And I think as, as a broker that we've been selling buildings for a lot of years, most people never asked about the resident profile. I think it was given short shrift when you bought a building. When you buy a commercial property, it, it's all about the resident profile, right? And so now I think that people are looking at the resident profile a little more carefully when they buy an apartment building. And so, you know, a building full of nurses versus a building full of restaurant workers might have a different um, um, might have a different valuation. I guess I guess that's really what I'm saying. It's pretty pretty hard for me to pinpoint that and give you an example, but um, you know turnover vacancies and things like that. Um, you know for the first time became more of the discussion in transacting buildings. Um, some of the challenges we have and still have when we're when we're selling buildings and showing them is you know residents don't allow you into their units. Um, so before what we do is let's say two or three years ago, if we were selling a hundred unit building, we would just give notice to the entire building that we we're going to do an inspection 24 hours in advance. And then the buyer, he didn't want to look at all hundred units, but he'd randomly go through the units or, you know, he picked some on the top floor to see if the roof was leaking, or he'd pick some of the, the tenants who had been there a long time. So he saw what the older units looked like, as opposed to seeing renovated units um, only. We found that tenants were saying, well, you can't, you can't enter my apartment, it's, it's COVID. So that made selling the building more challenging and buyers had to accept that they weren't going to be able to go through as many units as they, as, as they typically go through. So vacancies um, varied from building to building, but overall, I think they have come down. And I would say in the suburban areas, in the smaller centers, you can take London, Kitchener, Waterloo, um, you know, vacancies are, are went up to some extent, and then they have dramatically gone down to levels that were tighter than pre COVID. The only places that, you know, remain soft would be, you know, the downtown, the downtown cores of, uh, of major Canadian cities. But I think that that problem is on its way to solving itself. Right. Um, <laughs> I, guess I, I want to talk a little bit about um, rental uh, rental tenure, and really what's happening in buildings. And this is related to rent. There is a, and and, and this is to a large extent an Ontario story, but this is a um, bifurcation that's occurring. Okay, so you have one building, but you really have two types of units in the building. So in, for, 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 for argument's sake, so I'll just assume that if you've got a 200 unit building, you've got 100 units that have chronically depressed rents, okay? That's an old term that I'm using, but you know the tenants have been living there for a long, long time, 10 or 15 years, their rents are way below market, okay? They're not, and they're not moving out. They're, they, they, they're almost trapped in their apartments because they can't replace that apartment at the same price. Right. So if you're an apartment owner and you have those hundred tenants, they're only going to move when they have to move. You might have to hire an actuary to look at their age to see when they're going to move, if you, if you get my point. Right. So you got half your building that is staying put in these rents that are significantly below market. And as time goes on, that gap widens and they get more, more locked in to that unit. Than they, than they were the previous year, than they were the previous year, and so on. And then you've got the market rent apartments. So those are the ones that have turned over. You have raised the rent to market rents. Oftentimes, the owner goes in and spends a significant amount of money on the building that, quite frankly, needs to be spent. Okay, 
and you can spend five, 10, 15, $20,000. And now you get people that are closer to the market, right? So old tenant moves out, you renovate, you get a new rent. And now that new tenant has moved in, gets locked in at that rent and gets the annual guidelines. I'm not talking about new buildings here, but in those buildings where you're closer to the market, this is where that sort of bifurcation happens you get a higher turnover. So you might get a 20 or a 30% turnover on those units. Let's say you get 30% turnover on those and you get 10% turnover on your old units for an average of 20%. But really what I'm saying is, is that same unit is turning over. Make sense? So that same unit closer to the market is turning over like this. And then the other ones are only turning over when there's life change situations for people, and that that bifurcation, I think, is um, is more pronounced than it was before. Okay, so that's that's sort of the comment on on on, on rental bifurcation. Um, on, on on new apartment construction, um, you know, it's it, it to us it seems almost um, unstoppable, um, unstoppable. Um, we find that our our feasibility study business. Uh, is is as strong as it was pre-shutdown. Uh, during the initial part of the shutdown, and I'm just using the, the number of studies we do as a benchmark for the interest in new apartment construction. That's why I'm, uh, for the lack of data, I'm just saying, well, what we're seeing. We saw clearly a slowdown in March, uh, you know, uh, when, you know when, when, when the shutdown first occurred, March, April, May, June, and we finished up our studies. But I'll tell you, by the, by the summer uh, and by the fall, the marketplace had returned and now, you know, a year later, we're seeing really no, no slowdown in the interest in new apartment construction. We typically have about a hundred and some odd people come to our annual event, which we'll be doing for, for 10 years. I expect that we'll reach that kind of number again this year for our, for our event on the 28th and the 29th. Um, I think it might be fair to say that the downtown cores have paused uh, in new apartment construction. You, you can't stop new apartment construction, but you know, the, the rise in construction costs has probably been the most severe on, you know, on high rises and in the downtown and, and the time it takes and so on. So, so may, maybe, maybe a new apartment construction isn't as, as, isn't as viable as it was in the downtown core as it was uh, pre-shutdown. And, and the other thing that I would say about new apartment construction is, is that, you know, because of the increase in construction costs, I think you need to be so much more sure and cognizant of the rents that you're going to charge, okay? And that's harder to do because you're prognosticating out one, two, three, four years on where the rent will be, right? When you do a feasibility study, you don't necessarily know where, um, where construction costs are going to be. So it's a more, it's, it's a harder, it's probably a harder financial decision to make. I think that's less of an issue as you go to low rise product, the, the low rise marketplace in Kitchener, Waterloo, London, um, Peterborough and, and things like that. That rental demand has gotten stronger. Vacancies have gone down and rents have gone up. So we see more overall confidence in the areas outside of the major metropolitan areas. And we see new construction there um, doing, doing really, really quite well. Um, the next topic I wanna to talk about is, uh, is, is you know, um, apartment demand and, and investor demand and how people are viewing the, the apartment industry. So investor demand has been um, very strong. Um, there is always, there are always more buyers than there are sellers in the apartment sector. That, that doesn't change. Recession, uh, 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 coronavirus, boom time, whatever. There's, there's a short supply of apartments. And that's why we say to people, rather than, uh, why don't you be the supplier of apartments? Why don't you build them to sell them? Because there's so, such a demand out there. And, and, and that's clearly happening. But there is a shortage of apartments to buy, clearly, um, always is. And as a result, you're seeing more and more people um, bidding on apartments and that is driving the price up per unit and it's driving the cap rate down. I'm gonna show you, Rod, if you could put up, the, put up the slide of 10 Albert Street. I normally don't do this, but you know, 
COVID has changed a lot about how buyers think, about how buyers live. And, and this is a building that we're about to list, okay? This is in Thorold, Ontario. Thorold is on the near the Welland Canal outside of uh, outside of St. Catharines. It's kind of in wine country. It's actually a lovely little city with a beautiful main street that's been redone and gentrified and so on. And one of our clients built this building and, and it would be on the smaller side of what we sell, but it, 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 it fascinated me, the building. And so we're gonna take this out to the marketplace next week. For those of you brokers that are on here, you might want to, you know, you might want to sign the CA and get the package and, and so on. But this is a, a building, you can see it, 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 it's a, how would you describe this building? It's cute. It's, but what I visualized here was someone buying this building that was actually a user of the building. Okay, so on the ground first of all, there's a, it's, it's really nicely built. Okay? There is, there's office space on the ground floor. So if you were, I could almost see myself living in the business, in, in the building here, right? Um, you know, if you were someone who were uh, in your own business, there's some great office space on the ground floor. You could have all of it, some of it, and it's partitioned up nicely, okay? Um, on the one, two, on the three floors there, there's six apartments each. They are quite large. They are, I would say, uh, average probably 1,200 square feet. You could combine two and live in them. So just imagine now you're a, an entrepreneurial guy. You've got a, a really a brand new building to live in. You've got office space on the ground floor that you can use, expand, or not use. You've got apartments that are condo quality. But here's the other thing that I thought about. Some of my children could also, I don't want my children living with me and they don't want to live with me, but I would like them to live close by on a different floor, right? And so I'm visualizing a buyer who says, you know, I've got the, the building's going to be $14 million. I'm it, it, probably a little more than that, but in around that range. Um, you know, I, I can visualize someone living in the building. I can visualize someone working in the building. And actually, if you look at the top pictures there, you'll see there's a really a significant rooftop deck there, right? With barbecues, with a dog run on, I could see someone actually playing in the building. And when I met the owner of the building, what I said to him is, I believe this building will sell for a non-financial price. Okay, meaning that the own, the buyer is going to say, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll, I'm not looking for a yield here. I'm looking for a way to live, work, and play here, okay? And by a non-financial price, I mean, we sold um, several buildings in Waterloo right next door to Wilfrid Laurier University. They were not a financial buyer. They wanted it for their students and they wanted it for the next hundred years so that they own the land, so that they would get the land next door to the university. They were a non-financial buyer. I think somebody for buildings like this and as, as a broker or as a, as a builder, start thinking about things that are beyond just a cap rate discussion and, and how people live there and things like that. So that's it's, it's a changing marketplace. I don't think I've ever promoted a building this way before. Um, and the other thing I've noticed as, as a broker is that People want a lot more video content about the building. We've got a number of buildings. We've got a large portfolio of 12 buildings for sale uh, in Southwestern Ontario where the strategic advisors on it. And we've, we've probably done, I don't know, a few hours of video through the 12 buildings. We went through all the elevator rooms, all the furnace rooms, all the garages, and gave people a video tour of the building so that they could minimize the time and effort right outside of their office. They still have to visit the building, obviously, but they got to see everything before they got there and then they could select what they wanted to see. So I think it's, I think it's very interesting in terms of investor demand. Um, apartments have been, the apartments have done great during the shutdown. Uh, they are, they, we've always known them to be recession proof, but it, it almost looks like they are um, a renter or, or, they're, or they're virus proof now. So, when you think about you know the buyers and the sellers, the you know the investors, um, I think it's I think it's fair to say that institutions, and we're talking about the larger buildings now, are the ones buying, and families are the people who are selling. COVID has been challenging on families who own apartments; they don't have the infrastructure institutions have, and there was a lot more work to do now. 
you know, um, you know, and so on. Um, so uh, someone asked a good question. What's the implication about someone buy a non-financial buyer? Well, a non-financial buyer typically means higher prices for you, the seller. And if I'm selling a bill, it's a really good question. If I'm selling a building to a non-financial buyer, so if I were buying a, an office building for my company, I'm not thinking about the return I'm going to get. I'm thinking about, does this suit my needs? And if it suits my needs, then I'm going to pay the rent that they're asking, right? So it's not often that in a multifamily building, you get something that is non-financial, except in the case where I talked about, where it's beside the university. They want it for their students. They want it for the land in 50 or 100 years when they tear down the buildings. And so that, that apartment I showed you there, what I'm trying to do is get a higher price for our clients by saying, I'm gonna find you a non-financial buyer who's going to live in the building, work in the building, have his family in the building and so on. It's an unusual, it's an unusual scenario. Um, you see non-financial buyers, you know, you're not gonna get a 200 unit building that's non-financial. I mean, that's being bought by an institution, but sometimes an institution pay a higher price because they're about to open a fund or they're about to close a fund and they just need one more asset to put in there, right? Um, so overall, I guess the, the point I make is in terms of the buyers and the sellers, the, the buyers are um, institutions for the larger projects. And for the um, smaller projects, there's a lot of new people getting in the business because they don't know where to put their money and apartments are an easy business to understand. Everybody understands it. Uh, families, uh, I think are still the majority owners of apartments, um, long-term family owners. Sometimes they were the an, an original developer. Sometimes they're not, but they've owned it for 10, 20, 30 years. I think these families are in, uh, in, in a bit of a quandary and here's the challenges they face. They don't want to pay the taxes and there are significant taxes to pay, right? Significant tax pay. But here's the question I asked them. Do you think taxes are going to be lower in the future? And nobody says, they're going to be low in the future. You know taxes are going to be high in the future. So the tax bill has to get paid. You need to get professional advice on that. But that's one of the reasons to keep people from selling. Say, yeah, I'm, I'm tired. My, my kids just don't want to be in the business, whatever, but I don't want to pay the taxes, right? Taxes are going up. You might want to rethink that a little bit. The next is people say, well, you know, I might get a higher price in the future. And you certainly can't argue with them. For the last 20 years, they've been right. Every year, apartment prices have gone up, right? And right now, even with NOI shrinking, apartment values have gone up, but they've gone up because of interest rates. And that's why, so people have actually had their cash flow go down, but their value go up because interest rates are so low, that pushes the cap rate down. If you believe interest rates will go lower, there is a 0.64% correlation between interest rates and cap rates. That means the cap rates will probably go lower. If you believe they're as low as they can go, then you know this could be close to the top of the market. Nobody is ever going to um, catch the top of the market, but I think what I could say to you today is if you're a family and you're, you're a little tired, then I think that you would, be, you would get a very good price today and uh, hopefully you'd catch you know, near the top of the market, but, but nobody knows that. And the third one that people say, you know, like I don't, I don't wanna sell because I don't know what to do with the money, okay? Here's the one thing I'm sure of, very few apartment owners are gonna sell their portfolio and buy Bitcoin. Like apartment owners are real hard asset guys, right? And they typically don't take back shares of REITs. Some do, we've done a few transactions that way, but, um, but you know, people don't know what to do with the money and that, that, that's a way deeper discussion than anything that we could talk about you know, here today. So that's the three reasons people don't sell. I don't wanna pay the taxes. I think the price could get higher. And, uh, and I don't know what to do with the money. Now, let's look at the reasons for people to keep their apartments because as more decide to sell, there's still a lot of buyers. If enough decide to sell, price, prices would be affected because there'd be more supply, but we're a long way from reaching a balance between buyer and seller. What are the reasons to keep your building? Well, I think that there are three. Number one is that you have a vision for your building. A lot of the buildings are 50, 60 years old, okay? In our lifetime, some of these buildings are going to be 100 years old, right? And so what's your vision for that building built in the 1960s or the 70s, right? Um, do you have the staying power? Because a lot of buildings are now owned by families. The cash flow is being distributed. You need to put more money back into the building. And people have gotten used to getting their cash flow checks. So that, that creates scenarios. So do you have a vision for the building? Do you have staying power? I guess the third is, do you love the business? Do you love the business, right? 
And, uh, you know, if you love the business and you've got vision, you've got money, then, you know, buckle down because it's been a great investment for the last 40 years. Nothing says it's not going to be a great investment for the next 40 years for, you know, for you and your children. But that's kind of the decision point that I think people are at. And COVID has just forced people to think more about more about their business. Um, last comment I want to make about the uh, the investor demand is that, you know, the the buyer and I'm talking here mainly about the uh, mainly about the institutional buyer. Um, you know, they're using they've seen apartments do well. They've seen um, um, it, it as being a very safe asset class. Everybody knew that, but that's been solidified even more. They are using other people's money. The institutions get a fee when they buy. They still got a fiduciary responsibility. And they're not going to pay any price for it. And then they just see the safety of the apartment business, which I think has been has been very, very significant. And, and, and the last one I want to talk about is uh, is, is renter demand. And, uh, you know, I think that your home has become more important to you as you've been in your apartment or your house. Home renovations are through the roof. You can't buy you know, all the things you need for your house, including appliances and things like that. So homes have become important, whether they be apartments or whether they be, you know, um, um, uh, under home ownership. And I think that renter demand has been strong. Renter demand for uh, quality has been, uh, you know, has, 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 has been also strong. So that, I think, Rod, that pretty much completes what I wanted to say. Got a couple of other, maybe you can just go to full screen now with me and I'll just share a couple of other things that we have uh, going on. And, um, Okay, good, good. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we do have our, our session on affordable housing and uh, new apartment development. Historically, our session, we, we've done the session on, um, on, on, on new apartment development. This year, we added affordable housing to it. So on all the panels, we'll be talking about not just conventional apartment development, as well as affordable housing. We think that that's, it's not replacing privately built apartments but it's something that, that, that we think is gonna be pretty significant and, and we want to be ahead of that. And okay, Rod, next slide. And, uh, and, and we want you to be ahead of that with the information we have. We have um, uh, 50 or 60 live spots. We're holding at the Royal Military College Institute on University Avenue. And if you come, it is going to be posh. Okay, you've been locked up for 18 months. We are going to feed you. And uh, uh, is it politically correct to say liquor you up? Probably not. Probably not, but uh, it'll be nice. It'll be nice. Um, the um, okay. So so upcoming events. We have a free event on October nineteenth. How to hire, train, and compensate leasing professionals. Um, in new construction uh, leasing and in any even in turnover leasing is extraordinarily important. And this seminar, uh, which is free for you, uh, can come and we'll talk about how you hire, how you train, and how you manage your leasing consultants. Yeah. And then, and then starting on October, uh, November 16th to December 4th, we have our apartment leasing uh, university where we have training classes for your frontline staff and for property managers and owners as well. Okay, Rod, next one. Uh, happy to say that um, we have after 18 months of toiling away, uh, we, we've written a hardcover book. It's about 230 pages. Um, it'll be in uh, Amazon and places like that, as well as our webpage. It's called the intentional apartment developer. We thought about the word intentional. You know, you are building apartments as a new career, a new division of your company, and you can pre-order the book. And we have an advanced copy of the an earlier book to send you as a as a gift for uh, for buying in advance. Um, we've just finished our first um, manuscript draft now of affordable housing um, in Canada, and this is a guide to building affordable housing. It's not about the philosophy you need, it's about how you build affordable housing. I think that people will find it, um, uh, you know, very, very, very interesting if affordable housing interests you. And the last slide, Rod, um, you know, we, we'd love to add value to your life. Uh, tell us the topics you'd like us to talk about uh, in general or in these quarterly uh, downloads. Um, and uh, Rod, Rod, Rod will answer all the questions that are coming in the, um, in the, in, in the chat room, okay? And, and Rod, last slide. Um, it's been um, unbelievable how, uh, when Rod said to me, we're doing our Q4 download of Jan in January 6th, I thought, oh my goodness, it is the middle of October and uh, the year has gone by quickly. Um, so we want to thank you all for joining us. We did um, probably 40 different webinars over the year where 
anxious to be back out there amongst people and talking to people and doing events uh, events live. So thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, count your blessings and it's, it's a blessed country. Uh, we'll see you on uh, uh, January 6, 2022 for our next update. All right, Rod, thank you. We recorded this and uh, if you want to watch it again, I don't know why you'd want to watch it again, but or you want to have a friend look at it, it'll be on our webpage. So thanks again for joining us and um, keep sending us your feedback. Gary, good to see you, man. Mr. Mr. Ismail. Wonderful to see you too. Nice to see you guys. Okay, all right, good. Okay, thank you.